Okay, so I am going to do the genetics part two lecture through Zoom again so that I can write on, um, on the whiteboard. I got my fancy little pen, we'll see if it works. And what you should have in front of you, yeah, you can't see that. Okay, what if I turn? you still can't see that uh it should <laughs> it should say co-dominance and incomplete dominance practice problems and so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go ahead and share the presentation with you yes i got an email um I, and once again y'all this is going to be a little bit of a struggle um you know, editing slide show from current slide okay all right let me just get this all set up here okay cool don't give me a virus all right so um we're we're it's still the same slideshow um but this time we are on the second half and where did we leave off last time? All right, we left off doing dihybrid crosses. The good news for today is that there are no dihybrid crosses. Um, we are doing just four box Punnett squares, but they are a little bit more complicated. Um, you're doing the same process, but you're interpreting the results a little bit differently. All right, we did that. I told you to skip rule of multiplication. I asked you to skip um, Rule of addition. We're not going to do that. Okay, so we're this is where we are in the notes. You're going to want to fill in your notes for this. We're extending Mendelian genetics. And so what Mendel found is I'm just going to use the flower color, for example. If you cross a purple, a purebred purple flower with a purebred white flower, you end up with all purple flowers. Therefore, the color purple for the flower is dominant and the color white is recessive or the allele for white is recessive and so purple will overpower white and will um, basically like silence it. So we're going to extend this because that's actually not how it works for everything. That's how it works for some things and some of you have picked genetic diseases where it is either a complete dominant disease or complete recessive. And that's usually the case when it um, comes to diseases. But we're going to talk about patterns of inheritance, and we're, we're looking at the physical appearance of certain animals and different patterns of inheritance that don't follow complete dominance. So what we did before yesterday is called complete dominance. The heterozygote and the homozygote for the dominant allele are indistinguishable. So you wouldn't be, um, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So if you had, um, I'm going to see if, oh my God, this pen actually works. Yes. I didn't test it. I just like to wing it sometimes. So if you had, I just feel like I'm learning so much through this. Thank you guys for tolerating me. Um, if you had for a purple flower, whoa, this works so good. Big P, little P, or you had big P, big P, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference in the appearance, okay? That is called complete dominance. This is so exciting. Okay, um, what I want to talk about now is called incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance means if there, if there is a heterozygote, it is showing an in-between appearance. So the word that you need to write down here is in-between. Okay, in-between. Okay, so let's say you have a red flower and you have a white flower. Red is dominant. I'll just do like big R, big R. White is recessive. Let's just say white's recessive, little r, little r. What happens if this is incomplete dominance? What happens if you have a big R little r. What happens when you have a heterozygote if it's incomplete dominance and it's an in-between physical trait? You would have pink, okay? And so I'm going to show you um, in a second here like a Punnett square that goes with that. I am loving my new pen. 
Yes. All right. So I'm just going to click off of that and kind of move on. So if you had a red flower and a white flower and you made pink flowers, that would be incomplete dominance. Okay. Now with this picture, it's kind of confusing because you're like, wait, you use big R, little r. There are different ways to, um, to, to write the letters. I do not like the way that the textbook writes the letters. I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't, I, I just don't like it. What I prefer to use is either like for the red flower, I would use big R, big R. And for the white flower, I would use little r, little r. And for the pink flower, I would use big R, little r. Okay, so if you prefer that, you can write that down. They use R's and W's and then a C. I just don't even see the point of putting the C in there. And you'll see with blood typing problems too. I'm like, why are we putting these extra letters? All that does is present an opportunity to mess up on something. So if you are comfortable using just dominant recessive letters, but then knowing if you have a heterozygote, it's gonna show the in-between trait, I think that's easier. The other thing that you will see, and you're gonna see this on your problems, I ha remember I have to erase fully before I move on to the next slide, so it does take a little bit of time, so just, you know, relax. What you can see is, um, pin, draw. What you can see is big R, big R, and then um, some people will use R, like apostrophe or prime, whatever you want to call that, and R apostrophe. So you're going to see that on your um, problems that you work. So then what would pink be? Big R, R with a little apostrophe on it. Okay. I hope I haven't confused anyone too much. Um, let me see what the next slide is. If it is moving on, then I want to make sure we work some problems. So make sure you have those problems in front of you. Yeah. So I'm looking at the actual problems right now, and I'm going to go to um, stop share, and then I'm going to go to the whiteboard. I'm not sure why I have to announce what I'm doing, but um, just bear with me because I'm not used to doing things like this. Okay. It looks like co-dominance, incomplete dominance practice worksheet. That's what you should see on the top. And then it goes into co-dominance problems. Well, we haven't gotten there yet. I like to do incomplete dominance first. So I'm going to go to the second page where it says incomplete dominance problems. And now it's talking about snapdragons. Those are flowers. So snapdragons flower color is controlled by incomplete dominance. The two alleles are red and white. Ooh, yes, this worksheet's doing it the way I like it. Um, obviously, I, I formatted this worksheet in Word, but I did take the problems from another teacher. So, um, so big R and little r, the heterozygous pheno or genotype is expressed as pink. So what's the phenotype of a plant with genotype big R, big R? So what would you write for that? So for big R, big R, it would be red. What is the phenotype of a plant with a genotype big R, little r, it would be pink. And then what is the phenotype of a plant with the genotype little r, little r, it would be white. Okay, so now you know those, you should be able to do any kind of Punnett square and give an answer for percentages, right? So the question, the first question, number seven, says a pink flowered plant a pink flowered plant. So we have those already written up top, so now I can erase them. A pink flowered plant, it's gotta be that, right? So we already said that, we kind of have like a key, like a genotype key. The pink flowered plant is crossed with a white flowered plant. What is the probability of producing pink flowers? Pink flowered plant. So you do that and you're crossing it with a white. And then you just do your Punnett square the way you would normally do it. Boom, boom, boom. Right, big R, little r, big R, little r, little r, little r, little r, little r. What's the probability of a pink flower plant? 50%. Okay, that's number seven. 
I really feel like y'all can do number eight, but let's do, y'all can do number eight. Let's do number nine together. Because we're moving on to a different trait. I've talked a lot about uh, red, white, and pink flowers. I want to make sure I do a problem with you where we're talking about something that's not flowers. I think these aren't flowers. In and Andalusian <laughs> fowls, <laughs> black individuals are big B, big B. White individuals are little b, little b. A homozygous black bird is crossed with a homozygous white bird. The offspring are bluish gray. So from that description, you can pretty much conclude, well, I have a black and a white and I cross them. Even though they're bluish gray, who cares? It still has the word gray. It's some kind of in between black and, and, and white, right? So that means that if they're gray, that means they're heterozygous. Show the cross of the genotypes and the phenotypes. Black, white, all of the offspring are gray. That is incomplete dominance. The heterozygote shows an in-between phenotype. Okay, um, that's basically it. Show the cross as well as the genotypes, the phenotypes of the parents and the offspring. I mean, that's pretty much it. And then number 10 is you, uh, you guys can do that one. So you have number eight and number 10 that you're gonna do on your own to show understanding. And, and that's it. I mean, that it's the same thing that we've been doing before, except we just interpret the results a little bit different. All right, uh, next up, I'm going to stop share. I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint here. Okay, moving on to co-dominance. Same thing, we're working the problem the exact same way using a Punnett square, but instead of an in-between, co-dominance means you actually have two traits that are both dominant that will both be expressed. So let me give you an example. A black chicken is crossed with a white chicken and you're told it's co-dominant. And students will say, yes, the offspring are gonna be all gray. No, that's incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance, they would all be gray. Co-dominance means black has to be shown and white has to be shown. So if you have a black chicken cross it by a pure white chicken, all of the offspring are going to be speckled black and white. That's co-dominance, okay? So hopefully you understand the difference there. Um, the other type of co-dominance is blood typing. I will get to that in a minute. And I think I wanna wait until everyone has really shown understanding of blood typing problems before you actually use your blood typing kit. Blood typing kit will be our last day activity and then your genetics um, presentation that you'll turn in, the electronic presentation will be due on Saturday. Um, so we're gonna wait on that. I wanna to go to the first page of the homework or the practice work. It's the co-dominance problems. I'm looking at number one. Explain the difference between incomplete dominance and co-dominance. So what I need you to do is if you can't answer that question, I need you to rewind this video and answer it. What is the difference? Think about the chicken thing I just talked about. And I want you to put that answer. If you don't get it, then email me and say, I really don't, I really don't understand the difference and I will write a blurb back to you. I'm trying to explain it or you can jump on Zoom. All right, then I'm looking at number two. It says, in a certain fish, blue scales and red scales are co-dominant. What's confusing about that, though, is that they have the red scales as little b, little b. You can continue to do that. The only thing I don't like is that it's, it's making it seem like red is recessive when it really is co-dominant. I don't want to use that. I'm going to do something different. Hopefully I don't confuse you more, but I, I want to do something different. So um, I'm going to say that blue scales are big B, big B. And then I'm going to say that red scales, that's supposed to be a B because I was thinking what I was going to put here, are big R, big R. So if they have two big Bs, they're blue. If they have two big Rs, they're red. What happens if they inherit one B? and one R, and it's co 
dominance. What happens? It says when a fish has a hybrid genotype, it has a patchwork of blue and red scales. So instead of it being some kind of crazy in between color, you see like a speckled, like patchwork of blue and red. Okay. So the question says, what is the genotype for blue? What's the genotype for red? What is the genotype for patchwork? And if you want to use the letters they're using, the big Bs and little Bs, you can. I, I definitely don't agree with doing that with co-dominance. I agree with doing that with incomplete, but not with co. Because with blood typing problems, you'll get totally messed up. So number three says, what happens if you breed a patchwork fish with a fish that only has blue scales. All right. Easy, right? I'm kind of running out of room, so it should be like that. And then I cross them. Cool. Looks like 50% are gonna be all blue and 50% are going to be patchwork. What is the probability of having fish with red scales? Zero. What is the probability of having fish with patchwork scales? 50%. Okay, so uh, be sure to um, email me if you're having prob problems with this. This is very difficult to teach through Zoom. It's very difficult to teach through video because normally a student would raise their hand and be like, wait a second, where did you get blah, 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 and I can correct it right then and there. Um, so that's what's really difficult about doing um, process stuff like math or genetics problems or something like that. But it is what it is. And um, we're just going to deal with it. So I, I really do think that you guys can do the other two problems for that one. So I'm going to move on. All right. Come on. All right. And am I on my, all right. Um, so in case you didn't know, if you have a red hair horse and a white hair horse and they breed, they make what's called rowan horses. Rowan horses will appear pink from a distance, but if you actually plucked the hairs out of a rowan horse, you would see a mixture of all red and all white but mixed together, um, it makes the horse look pink. So don't let anyone ever tell you that rowan horses are a result of incomplete dominance. They're not, they're co-dominance because they don't have pink hair. They have red and white hair that's mixed together, which appears pink. All right, um, multiple alleles means that the gene has uh, more than one alleles. So Blood typing is an example of multiple alleles. And then I would need you to also write that blood typing is also codom, no, codominance. That says codominance if you, yeah, that says codominance. So ABO blood type is also codominance. It's also complete dominance. And so blood typing can be kind of confusing, but I want us to, to really focus on this right now. Um, and I think you'll get it. A is dominant. B is also dominant. I is recessive. And you're like, where did I come from? I thought that was type O. I actually refers to O. I'm gonna put that in parentheses, but we use an I when we do Punnett squares. I don't know why. We just do. Um, I, I don't know why. I, whoever came up with the way to do this problem does. Could you put an O instead of an I and still get the right answer? Definitely. Definitely. Um, and, and maybe I'll do that. Um, the only thing is, is if you are, you know, moving on to AP, we have to use I. So I think I'm probably just going to use I for this class. If you want to use O, you can, but I'm probably going to use I. Actually, I am going to use I. All right, so if you're looking at your um, worksheets, we are now moving forward to where it says, and this is gonna represent most of your problems, co-dominance blood types. I do not like the way they um, annotate the, the um, table for this. I don't like using big I 
I don't see the reason why we should do that. So I want you to correct that chart. And I think my next slide actually has what you're supposed to do for it. Come on. Yeah, I don't like this. I don't like this. So what you're going to do is you're gonna correct this chart. And it's not really correcting it, it's just changing it because it's not wrong the way it is, it's just like unnecessary. All right, so if, if someone has type A blood type, they either have big A, big A, or big A, little I. I don't like this, I do it like that. So they got a dominant A allele from one parent and a dominant A allele from another parent, or they got a dominant A allele from one parent and a recessive allele from another. Same thing with B. So go ahead and then correct that chart on your notes and on this thing, because then if you're using big eyes, you're just gonna get super confused. Unless you wanna challenge yourself, go for it. I'm not gonna do it though. If someone has type B blood type, they're either big B, big B, or they're big B, I. So they either got a dominant B from one parent and a dominant B from another parent, or they got a dominant B from one parent and the recessive from the other. And I'm going to tell you exactly what blood type means and what the dominant A and dominant B and I actually actually mean in just a minute once we get this down. Type AB blood type can only be one thing. They got a dominant A from one parent and a dominant B from the other. All right. Type O blood type can only mean one thing. They got two little eyes from each parent. All right, so now that we have that done, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Okay, I'm gonna go over that in a minute. I don't like that, okay. I'm actually gonna go back a slide. So what does it mean to have the dominant A and the dominant B and the I? If you look down here on this chart, I think this is important to note on this chart. Um, if you have a dominant A allele, these are proteins and carbohydrates that are found on the outside of the red blood cell. And they're just hanging off. They're hanging off the membrane. Remember back when we were studying cell membrane, remember the membrane has proteins and it has carbohydrates. This is a very particular carbohydrate that's hanging off of a protein on a red blood cell membrane. If you get a dominant B allele, the protein and carbohydrate are going to look different. If you get both a dominant A and a dominant B allele, you have both types of proteins and carbohydrates hanging off the red blood cell. If you have the recessive allele, the red blood cell has nothing. If you have both recessive alleles, the red blood cell has nothing. So I means there really is no carbohydrate and protein associated with it at all. Okay. So if you were, look at B, if you were a B blood type and you have these little circles hanging off of your red blood cell and you were injected with A blood, would your immune system recognize these triangles right here? The answer is no, because your immune system is used to seeing these little circles. So if you have either big B, big B or big B I and you have this type of carbohydrate, these little circles on the outside of your red blood cell and you were infused, if you were infused with blood that was type A that had these triangles, your immune system would attack that blood, you would end up with blood clots and you would, you would not live through that. So that is why it's very important to get compatible blood. And so let me talk about that for just a second. This is the basis of like organ transplant rejection, blood rejection is what's hanging off of those blood cells and does your body recognize what's hanging off of those um, blood cells or, or those cell membranes period. So this is why <clears throat> when someone's getting a blood transfusion, they have to match the donor. Um, mixing a florin blood, it clumps and means death. 
We are not going to really worry about RH factor, but RH factor is a complete dominance. Um, I really didn't want to worry about it, but since I brought it up, I will. Um, so you can either have big R, big R, big R, little R, little R, little R. If someone is big R, big R for RH factor, it's something completely separate from blood type, but it actually is associated with the red blood cells. They're positive. If you're big R, little R, you're positive. If you're little R, little R, you're negative. Okay, once again, this is something that would be hanging off of the red blood cell, but it's a separate Punnett square that you would do. And so this is blood type compatibility. Um, who is the universal donor? The universal donor would be O negative. O negative means it's a completely naked red blood cell. So nobody is gonna recognize O negative as foreign. Okay, who is the universal receiver meaning they could recognize any, their body would recognize any blood type. It is actually this one. They would recognize A, they would recognize B, and they would recognize a positive RH factor. So O negative is the universal donor, AB positive is the universal receiver, and then you can kind of look at all the compatibilities in this chart in between that. Erase. Okay, I'm about to move on. This might be my last blood typing slide, so we'll do a problem. Okay, here we go. We're, we're not gonna look at the worksheet right now, we're just gonna do a problem. A man who is heterozygous for type A blood, look back at your chart. What does that mean to be heterozygous for type A? So they're type A, that means there's no Bs. But they're heterozygous, so that means they're not big A, big A. That means he is heterozygous. If he was homozygous for type A blood, he would be big A, big A, right? But he's heterozygous. He has the A and then the recessive like silent one. Mary's a woman who's homozygous, homozygous with type B. If she's homozygous for type B, that means she has both Bs. What possible blood types might their children have? I'm going to do a Punnett square the same way I did it before. I'm getting a lot of emails. Sorry. I'm not going to read them right now though because I'm doing this. All right. You would do a cross, kind of like you did before. So what are the possible blood types of their children? 50% of their children would be AB. 50% would just be plain B blood type. Okay. You know, this is probably not a lecture that I should do through Zoom. I'll remember this if we're still distance learning when I teach genetics next year. I think genetics should be taught through Zoom. I hate, I don't like teaching through Zoom just because if someone needs to rewind something, I think that's what I would do though, is teach through Zoom with an audience and then record it and send it out so someone can erase and watch it again. You live and you learn, right? Okay. All right, so we got that one. Uh, no, we're not doing a dihybrid. All right. Um, I want to now switch gears. Uh, well, not really switch gears. I want to switch over to uh, the home, the um, practice problems. So we go to my whiteboard and we're going to do some of the practice problems on your worksheet together. All right. So um, you corrected the chart. So I'm on co-dominance blood types. So I'm on those problems. And you corrected the chart. And so number one says, write the genotype for each person based on the description. Homozygous for B. That would be big B, big B, right? Heterozygous for A. Well, that's not homozygous, so it's not big A, big A. What makes A blood type heterozygous is big A, I. Type O would be little I, little I. Type A who had a type O parent. Ooh, this is getting complicated. So child is type A. But we don't know if they're AI or if they're AA. But we do know that one of their parents only had a little I to give because they were type O. So what does this child have to be because it says one of the parents was type O. 
So if one of the parents only had a little I to give, then if they're type A blood, they're carrying that I. All right, that was a tricky one. Oops, I meant to hit my eraser. Okay, um, next one says type AB. Cool, that's AB. <laughs> uh, next one says blood can be donated, donated to anybody. Whose blood can be donated to anybody? O negative. Who can only get blood from type O? Who can only get blood from type O? Type O. <laughs> little I, little I. Because think about it, little I, little I can't get from A, can't get from B, can't get from AB because it won't recognize either of those. It can only recognize I. So who can, um, if someone was this, who could they get blood from? They could get blood from someone who was perfectly compatible, right? Or they could get blood from someone who had that because they're going to recognize the A or they could get blood from someone who was that because they recognize those little eyes. They could not get blood from any of those people because they wouldn't recognize that B and the carbohydrate associated with that B. Okay. So I think it'll be um, interesting and kind of fun for you guys to do your blood type. So when you do your blood type, you're going to see exactly what your blood type is and you're going to also see your RH factor. So you will know after doing the blood typing kit tomorrow who you can get blood from. And then I think I included, I don't know how many lancets. I wonder if I gave you guys two lancets or three. I know I at least gave you an extra lancet. You can do one of your parents. If you already took anatomy with me, you already did this, maybe I would encourage you to either find someone, um, find someone else to test, find someone different to test and to practice on because it's actually kind of fun. And if you took my anatomy class, some of my A, um, my anti-A, the blue stuff was messed up. I mixed brand new anti-A for you. So this kit works for everybody. This is, this one is more legit than the one I sent out earlier this summer. So let's do some problems from the homework. I'm on number two now. Pretend that Drake, oh, Aspen's little brother. That's so weird because I was just texting your mom. Anyways, not appropriate for my lecture. Anyways, let's pretend Drake is homozygous for the type B allele. So little Drake. I'm trying to annotate on here. There we go. Little Drake has, he asked me, you should see if, you, if Drake will let you do the blood typing kit on him. <laughs> I hope Aspen watches the lectures. Anyways, um, pretend that Drake is homozygous for the type B allele. So he has to be that. Oh, never mind. We're talking about Drake, the actual musician here. <laughs> Nicki Minaj. <laughs> Nicki Minaj is type O. So she has to be. Wait, are they having babies? Ooh, scandalous. Oh, sorry. So Drake is big B, big B. Nicki Minaj is type O. And they are having babies. All right. Let's figure out what their babies are going to be. So if we cross Drake with Nicki Minaj right here, all the babies will be. They're all going to be heterozygous type B. Awesome. All right, you can do number three on your own. Number four. Oh, I love these ones. Typically, I'll give problems where it's like you are given a mom and you're given the baby and then you're given like a list of possible fathers and you pick who the father is. Uh, I, I only feel comfortable doing that in the classroom. I think the worksheet that went with that like was a little bit inappropriate. So, but I'll do that in the classroom usually is uh, who is the daddy. All right, number four, Mrs. Clink is type A and Mr. Clink is type O. They have three children named Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Sounds like they read the Bible a lot <laughs> or they just like those names. Mark is type O, Matthew is type A, and Luke is type AB. What? Based on this information, show work to prove your answers. Ooh, girl. 
that something's going, something's up here. Based on, okay, Mr. Clink must have the genotype. Okay, so if Mr. Clink is type O, he can only be that, right? So the only way you can have type O is if you have both recessive alleles. Okay, great. Mrs. Clink must have the genotype blank because blank has blank. Well, she was there on the day they were born and she, she can confirm that they came from her uterus and because it doesn't say any of them are adopted. So they all came out of her. So we know they're her kids. Um, she has one of the kids, Mark, is type O. So if Mark is type O, that means he got an I. So we know that, okay, so we know Mr. is big I, big I. Mrs. We know Mrs. Clink is type A, but we don't know if she's big A, big A, or if she's big AI. But we do know that Mark is this. He got one of those eyes from dad, supposedly. He had to get one from mom. So that's what she has to be, big AI. So Mrs. Clink must have the genotype big AI because Mark has the blood type O. Luke cannot be the child of these parents because neither parents, so we don't know if this is scandalous. Luke just may have been adopted or something, which like, that's cool. Um, he can't be the child of these parents. Well, he, he's probably her kid. He can be her kid. We just don't know if, if um, maybe he, um, just has a different father. Like he has to have a different father. If Miss Clink is his mother, he has to have a different father because he is AB. He is AB blood type. And that B didn't come from either one of those parents. It had to come from a parent with B blood type. All right. Okay, let's do number five and then I'll I'll stop. Hopefully I didn't get it too playful. On here. I usually get like this when I do blood typing problems. I just have so much fun with it. All right, number five, two parents think their baby was switched at the hospital. What? It's 1968, so DNA fingerprinting technology is not a thing. The only way we can tell is with blood typing. All right, let's find out. We're detectives today. Um, it says that the mother has blood type O. Okay, cool. So mom is big eye, big eye. And the father has blood type AB. So then AB, awesome. And the baby has blood type B. Okay. So the mother's genotype is big I, is little I, little I. The dad's genotype is um, AB. Let's cross these two parents and let's see what's, what's the kid's genotype. From what I'm seeing, I mean, they can't prove the baby was switched at birth because this could be their baby from what I'm just seeing right now. I don't know. Let's see what actually happens here. All right. So these are the possible outcomes. They could have babies with type A. They could have babies with type B. They can't have babies with type O. They can't have babies with type AB because the Punnett square reveals that that's not possible. So what's the baby's genotype? If the baby um, has type B blood, then that means the baby could be Big B, big B, or big B, I. If the baby was switched at birth, it would be this. If the baby was not switched at birth and the baby actually belongs to these two parents, did they say if it was a boy? They didn't say if it was boy or a girl. Okay, it has to be big B, little I, okay? So Punnett square showing all possible genotypes were pro children produced by this couple. We did that here. And was the baby switched? Um, that would be inconclusive because could the baby still have type B blood type and have been switched? Yes, it would have this um, genotype. Could the baby have type B blood type and not be switched? Yes, he would have this genotype. So just take the baby home and raise it because <laughs> there's nothing else you can do at this point. All right. Um, you can do, yeah, you can do number six on your own. Na, 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 na. Yeah, so you'll do number six on your own. And, and so you shouldn't have that many problems left to still do. Um, genetics can be kind of difficult. 
I think it's kind of fun. I'm gonna go over some vocab words. We're not done yet, because I'm still going over some vocab words. Let me erase this. And then I have a little table of vocabulary to go through. And then I wanna to talk to you a little bit about genetic testing during pregnancy. And oh my gosh, that will be the end of our material for this class. X, stop share, and do 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 PowerPoint here. All right. Got that. Okay, I want to talk about some different um, vocabulary words because all of these Punnett squares that we've done are just, they've been pretty straightforward. Even though we've done non-Mendelian genetics and we've talked about incomplete dominance, co-dominance, multiple alleles, there are still some things that need to be discussed, like polygenic inheritance. Polygenic inheritance means that for one phenotype, one outcome, and I want you to, well, it's already written down for you. If it's not already written down for you, polygenic inheritance, the classic examples are skin color and height, okay? Skin color and height. What that means is that there are more than one genes that determine that one outcome. So there are about six different genes that actually code for skin color. There are, gosh, I can't remember how many, there are, a lot of genes that actually determine what a person's height is going to be. Obviously nutrition plays, plays a part in that too, but if we're talking about just genetics, height is determined um, by multiple genes. So that's polygenic inheritance. Actually, uh, is this showing, this is showing eight, whatever. So this is just showing you a Punnett square for, um, for skin color and how, gosh, if we actually did one, that would be, that'd be a really big Punnett square and we're not gonna do that. So all I'm trying to get you to see here is that there's not just one gene that is gonna code for skin color or height, okay? And so this just kind of showed you the, very, the, the degrees. And so something that I want to point out here that I think is, is important to know is that um, we all have the same gene for skin color. If all of your alleles are recessive, your skin will be lighter. If all of your genes are dominant, your skin, the more dominant the alleles become, the darker the skin color gets. And so what is this gene actually for? It's for melanin deposition. So if someone has a dominant allele for these genes, melanin is gonna be deposited into the skin cells. And what is melanin for? Melanin is for protecting a person against UV damage. And so how did humans evolve to have different skin colors? It just depends on where they lived and how intense UV um, light was. So the more intense UV light was, the more likely a person that had these dominant genes would have survived because the melanin would have protected them against skin cancer, okay? The less likely um, or the less intense UV light from the sun was, um, the more likely a person would not need those dominant genes because they don't need the melanin because either it's really, really, really cold and they're never outside or they're just at a place on earth where the sun intensity isn't as much so you wouldn't need that dominant gene. So what, um, what I think it's important to see here is that um, skin color is a result of natural selection or evolution based on survival at different UV light intensities. It's really all it is. Okay. Other words um, that I think are important to know. So we've done complete dominance. So polygenic inheritance, and then I gave you the, um, the skin color and the height examples, the polygenic inheritance. Complete dominance, we already talked about that. Okay. So that's nothing new. Incomplete dominance, we already talked about that. That's nothing new. Co-dominance, we already talked about. Both, uh, both uh, traits are expressed at the same time. Um, multiple alleles, we talked about that. ABO blood groups have three. We're dealing with A, B, and I instead of just A, B. Pleiotropy is something we have not talked about, and that's an important vocab word for you to know. One gene has multiple phenotypic effects. So if polygenic inheritance is multiple genes have one phenotypic effect. Pleiotropy is the opposite. One gene has multiple phenotypic effects. Can you kind of, I, I know it sounds like I just said the same thing, but I didn't. So let me draw something out for you. Pleiotropy is 
one gene has multiple phenotypic effects. One gene can cause a bunch of different outcomes like the sickle cell gene. That's one mutation can cause multiple effects like fatigue, uh, blood clots, um, tingling and numbness in the extremities, um, heart issues, stuff like that. So usually anytime you, um, you see um, a disease or a genetic disease, that is an example of pleiotropy because it's one gene that's having multiple effects on a person. Okay, so let me compare that to polygenic inheritance. So polygenic inheritance. So I'm on this one right now. I'm not going to talk about the, the, the puppies just right now. Although the puppies are usually like everyone usually in class, everyone like perks up when I start talking about the labs and the um, fur color. Polygenic inheritance means multiple genes. So look at the difference in the picture. Multiple genes all play in to one phenotype. All right. So hopefully, hopefully my video is not lagging too much and hopefully that made sense. All right, epistasis. All epistasis means is the expression of one gene is in, affected by the expression of the other. So if you look B, if you look on here, B has to do with, the Bs have to do with fur color. So dominant B, that's for black fur. This is not working and I feel like my video is lagging. I wrote the word black there in case you can't tell. <laughs> Dominant B, and this is actually true. If you have a lab, this is true. Dominant B is black fur. Recessive is brown. You know, I think this might be a sign that I should just end the video soon because this isn't, I'm lagging. It's not working very well. It must be my internet. Um, so uh, little B is brown. So if they are big B, big B, they'll be black. If they're big B, little B, they'll be black. If they're little B, little B, they'll be brown. But this second gene has to also be dominant, okay? So if you look at this Punnett square right here, how do you get yellow labs then? Well, if you notice, if you have a little e, little e, little e, little e, if that second gene is homozygous recessive, then it doesn't matter what your big B little, it doesn't matter what your Bs are, that color will not be expressed no matter what. And that's called epistasis. So um, what, which one, so if you were to do the Punnett square and you were to act, okay, now I'm not lagging anymore, good. So this must mean I should continue talking. So if you were to actually write out the genotype for this black dog right here, if you cross those two things, what would you get? Big B, big B, big E, big E, cool. What about this brown one right here? If you were to write out the genotype for that brown one, what would you get? Little B, little B, big E, Big E. Awesome. What about this brown one right here? What would you get? You would get little b, little b, big E, little e. So do you see, as long as the E is dominant, you will either get a black or a brown dog. But, but, if you don't have a dominant E, Technically, we'd be like, oh yeah, that's a black dog. No, it's not. That's this dog right here. It's yellow. What about this? You would say, oh, that's a brown dog. Nope, because the, that's, hold on, which one is it? That's this one right here, okay? Hopefully that kind of makes sense. If you have two, the second gene is homozygous recessive, it doesn't matter what the first gene is, the first gene won't be expressed. And so lab color is a really um, common example given for that one. All right, let me erase this and then let me go to my next slide, make sure there's nothing else I want to talk about. I just got to savor these last moments with you guys, you know? I mean, gosh. Okay, hold on. I'm lagging again. Okay. X. All right. Last thing is um, genetic disorders. Okay, 
Um, if a genetic disorder is autosomal recessive, that means that both, they have to inherit two recessive genes to have that disease. Cystic fibrosis is an example, Tay-Sachs, sickle cell, fetal, phenylketonuria. Um, if it is an autosomal dominant disease, like Huntington's disease, that's like a, a neurological degeneration, so that the neurons are going to degenerate. All they have to have is one dominant allele. So, uh, so if one parent has Huntington's disease um, and they're carrying one dominant allele, all their kid has to inherit is one dominant allele. Um, if you want to say dwarfism is like that too. I'm sure y'all didn't know that, but dwarfism is caused from a dominant gene. You don't have dwarfism because both of your alleles are recessive for that gene. So just because something, and you're like, wait, it's dominant, but they're... But dwarfism isn't that common. No, it's not. Just because a trait is dominant doesn't mean it's most common, right? I want to say um, widow's peak. So if you have a widow's peak, it's like a tri. If your hair pattern is like a triangle right here, if we were in the classroom right now and I said everyone looked around, look around and let's count how many people have a widow's peak, we'd probably find one or two people out of twenty. But having a widow's peak is actually a dominant trait. It's re it's expressed from a dominant allele. It's just most of us have both recessive alleles for it. All right, so um, you can either have recessive disorders, you can have autosomal dominant. Some of you have picked X-linked, sex-linked disorders. I will need to talk to you separately about those because we're not actually doing sex-linked traits in this class. Um, how can you tell if you are pregnant, if your baby is gonna have a genetic uh, disorder? Women who are 35 and older are considered geriatric. They're not considered geriatric, but if they're pregnant, it's considered a geriatric pregnancy. And so they are definitely um, encouraged to get what's called an amniocentesis. An amniocentesis is where they draw amniotic fluid with this huge needle right here. I never got any of these done because none of my pregnancies were geriatric. I'm 36 now, so if I were, which I won't because I already have too many kids, um, I, I would probably have to get something like this done. Um, and so they take the amniotic fluid, which will have some of the baby cells. Some of the baby cells, like skin cells, are going to be floating around in there. And then they'll do genetic tests to see if the baby has any genetic disorders. Another thing that they can do <laughs> is this thing called chorionic villus sampling. And so chorionic villus sampling uh, is where they stick this thing, this long little, it has a little pincher at the end. They'll stick it all the way through. So this is, this is the vaginal canal right here. This is the cervix. This is the uterus. And then there's a baby in there. So she's been like cut in half. And then this is her, like if she was laying on a table, this would be her left leg. And then that's the vaginal canal. All right. So what they would do is they'd stick this thing up there and they'd pinch off a piece of the placenta and they would test the placenta. Or they could stick uh, a giant needle through the abdomen, through the muscle, and then they would pinch it off like that. I just think those, both of those would be pretty painful. So those are three different ways. One of them is an amniocentesis where they just collect the fluid. The other one is they use either one of these two methods, chorionic villus sampling, where they actually pinch off a piece of the placenta and test it. So um, what are the benefits? Well, the benefit of getting this done, either of these done, is that you would know if the baby was going to have a genetic disorder. Um, and then whatever decision a person would want to make um, is the decision they want to make after that. Some people are like, it doesn't matter if my baby has a disorder or not, I'm, I'm definitely keeping this baby, but then they can prepare um, financially and, and you know, career-wise what they want to do after that. And then they can learn about the disorder instead of the day she gives birth and it's like, surprise. Um, so then they would know what to do. So this, just because someone gets a test like this done doesn't mean that they would abort the fetus if something was wrong with it. People who are anti-abortion also get this done. Um, but we're not gonna, we don't get into that, but just in case you wanted to know why people get this done. Could be either one. All right, so um, the amniocentesis uh, has a less risk for miscarriage. So if you stick a big giant needle into um, the uterus, the body might be like, whoa, something's going wrong and might actually, the body itself might abort the fetus. There is a risk in that. I think it's like a 1%, I wanna say it's a one in 100. So one in 100 women that get this done, please don't quote me on that, I do need to look it up before our next Zoom meeting, um, could potentially, uh, have a miscarriage. Um, on this one, there is a 2% chance that a person can have a miscarriage. So the miscarriage risk with chorionic villus sampling is a lot higher, but a person can get it done earlier. 
And eight to 10 weeks, finding out that the baby has a genetic disorder is a lot different than finding out at 14 to 16 weeks in terms of what the woman's options are at that point. Okay, and so I think that is the end of my slideshow. And uh, hopefully if anyone needs help, you can ask for help. This was a lot of stuff to cover in one day, so I understand if it's hard, um, but please take the time. The only thing you have to do today is the, are the genetic problems. So um, please um, go ahead and reach out if you need help with that, and I will talk to you guys later.